us back to church Sunday. <clears throat> and in 1 Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> I'd like to read just a few verses that tell us about one of the important truths about the local church. The Bible says, and I'll begin reading in verse number 14. <clears throat> These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, <clears throat> justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Notice please, the apostle, notice please the apostle Paul as he gives his description of the church in verse number 15. He's writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he says to Timothy in verse number 15, he describes the church of God as the pillar and ground of truth. Not the pillow, P-I-L-L-O-W, but pillar. The church is the pillar. <clears throat> it's the foundation. It's the pillar and ground of truth. And uh, I want to preach this morning on that subject <clears throat> you know, we come to a day like this and people are being encouraged all across the country to, to get back in church. And of course, today I realize I'm <clears throat> preaching to the choir this morning. You're in church. I'd like to preach this message to the folks that are at home today. And uh, maybe we ought to make some CDs and send it to them. But, uh, you know, why go to church? You know, some people ask the question today, why, why even bother to go to church? Uh, I've heard it said more than once. I can worship God at home. Well, you know, why go to church? What's the purpose of going to church? We know why we go to school, right? We go to school to get an education so we can make a living. We know why we go to work. We go to work to make money to pay the bills. <clears throat> we know why we go to the store to buy necessary food and clothing. <clears throat> We go to the lake to fish. We go to the ball game to cheer. We go to the golf course to, to lie and cuss. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but why do we go to church? <laughs> oh, why, why go through the hassle of getting up Sunday morning <clears throat> on one of the few days that you have off work? Go through the hassle of getting all dressed up and getting the kids ready and <clears throat> getting in the car, finding your Bibles and uh, pocketbooks and purses and keys and wallets and, and uh, finding a parking place and then <clears throat> trying to find a parking place near the front and come in and try to find a seat near the back. Uh, <laughs> I'm in a good mood this morning, by the way. <laughs> oh, why go through all the, 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 the problem, you know? Why go to church? Well, if you found yourself ask, asking yourself that question, I read a recent survey that says, I don't know how true this is, but it says 70% of Americans identify themselves as Christians. But only 20%, <clears throat> a little over 20%, 22%, attend church on a regular basis. If 70% of Americans consider themselves to be Christian, and that's a broad term for most people, <clears throat> but only 22% are attending church on a regular basis, something is wrong. But for us who, you know, in other words, some people look at church as an unnecessary burden, uh, some people look at the church, about attending church, as just something to keep the wife or the preacher off my back, you know. 
But <clears throat> it's kind of like the, the, the wife that was trying to wake her husband up one morning to go to church, and he was in bed, and she was shaking him, Honey, get up, it's time to go to church. And <clears throat> He said, I don't want to go this morning. I want to stay in. I want to sleep in. And the wife said, Well, give me <clears throat> three reasons why you shouldn't go to church. And the man said, Well, I don't get anything out of the services. The people don't like me, and I don't like the people. <clears throat> And the husband said, give me three reasons why I should go. And the wife said, well, the Bible says you ought to go. He commands it. It's setting a good example for our children. And after all, you're the pastor. You need to go to church today. <laughs> all of us <laughs> need to see the importance of the church. I heard about the guy one time that was uh, being rescued from an island. He was lost on a des deserted island for years. Nobody knew where he was. And he finally, a plane found the island, and he, they saw his, his smoke signal and circled around and picked him up and <clears throat> brought a helicopter, rather, and they picked him up. And as they were leaving, they looked down on the island. They saw three huts that were built. And they said to the guy, he's all by himself on the island. He said, what are those three huts? He said, well, that first hut is where I live. And he said, what are those other two? He said, well, the second hut is where I go to church. And that third hut is where I used to go to church. <laughs> Some people can't even agree with themselves, you know. <laughs> oh, but why should we be in church? You know, for people who, for those who understand... <clears throat> the purpose of the church, we can say this is one of the most enriching and spiritually fulfilling things that we can do with our life all week long is to find ourselves assembled together with God's people <clears throat> on the Lord's day. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And that's very important for us to be in church on the Lord's day. And uh, this morning, <clears throat> what are the ingredients of a great church? And we're talking, emphasizing the church today. And, of course, we just finished a series from the book of Acts. Look back with me, please, just a moment in the book of Acts chapter 2. And we see a great church example here in the book of, of Acts chapter 2. Look in verse 41. I want to go back and just reiterate a few things here from this chapter. Look in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41. The Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. <clears throat> and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Uh, and all that believed were together. Do you see that? They were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men and to every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily <clears throat> as such should be saved. And so we see here this church that the Lord is adding to. Uh, this church started with a group of 120 people, this nucleus in the book of Acts. And we preached about this, the 12 apostles. And then it grew to 120 disciples. <clears throat> and then in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it grew to 300 converts in one day that were baptized and added to the church. <clears throat> and then we see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, there were daily additions, the Lord adding to the church daily such as should be saved. And then we see in Acts chapter 4 and verse number 4, there were 5,000 converted and added to the church. And then we see in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, the scripture says there was the number of the disciples were multiplied. And then it says in Acts chapter 6 verse 7, the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. 
And so we see the church is moving, it's growing, <clears throat> and we see God blessing the church. And uh, this local church we find in the book of Acts was a Bible-believing New Testament church that was transforming lives and communities and cities. And that's how the church had its beginning. If you add all these numbers together, you'll find nearly 8,000 conversions within a span of just a few months in the book of Acts. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is a great church that we can pattern uh, our church after, of course. And I want to give you some things this morning, some ingredients today of a great church. Today, if you're looking for a church, by the way, you're sitting in church this morning. This is Victory Baptist Church of Londonderry. And this church began in 1980. Next year, Lord willing, if God, the Lord tarries is coming, <clears throat> next year we will celebrate 40 years of this church, the 40th anniversary next year in 2020. It's going to be a great celebration. But uh, think about this church today. If you're visiting this church and, and you're praying about a church home, I believe every person ought to have three homes. You ought to have a heavenly home, number one. You ought to know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. Amen? You ought to have a Christian home on this earth. If you have a heavenly home and you're a Christian, you ought to strive to have a Christian home. And number three, every Christian ought to have a church home <clears throat> that you could identify with and be a part of, you can belong to. And we see that practiced in the early church in the book of Acts. I encourage young people who leave our church and who attend college, uh, such as Caleb is there now and others. I encourage my own daughter, my own son, that when they left the Gulf Coast Baptist Church in Fort Myers, Florida, and they went to Crown College of the Bible, and they went there to, as a college student, that college is a ministry of the local church, Temple Baptist Church. And I encourage my children, when you go to college there and you're living in that area, you ought to join that church and be a part of that ministry <clears throat> and serve God and pray for that church, pray for that pastor. And my children did that. Even though they were there on a temporary basis, they were part of that local church. They were not distant from it. <clears throat> and I say this morning, I would encourage every Christian today to consider being a part of this church if you're not already a member here. Because at this church, you're going to find several things that are good ingredients, good things to look for in a great church. <clears throat> Number one, in a good church, you're going to find the preaching of the gospel. You're going to find the preaching of the gospel. Notice, please, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, look what the Bible says. <clears throat> the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, In verse 23, him having delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And uh, <clears throat> in verse 29, notice the scripture says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. <clears throat> Notice the Bible says in verse number <clears throat> 31, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And verse number 36 tells us, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. What are we seeing here? We're seeing the preaching of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the preaching of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
You find that here in chapter 2. You find this in chapter 3, in verse number 15, in verse 26. Verse 15 says that they killed the prince of life whom God hath raised him from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Verse 26 says, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. In chapter 4, in verse number 2, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> I'm saying in a good church you'll find the preaching of the gospel. Now I believe that the gospel is a particular message from the Bible. There are people today that can preach the Bible without ever preaching the gospel. I've said that before. In other words, you can preach the Beatitudes, you can preach the parables, you can talk about <clears throat> the miracles of Christ, you can preach on Bible characters, Bible stories, and Bible themes, and Bible words, and chapters. You can preach all around the gospel and never mention the gospel. But the gospel message, the Bible says, is the primary message of the Bible. It's the central message of the Bible. When you look at Peter's message here that I just read from, uh, Peter is focusing on the gospel. He focuses on the word made flesh. And he focuses on that, that word made flesh that died upon the cross and was crucified and whom God raised from the dead on the third day. That is the gospel message. And a good church will be given to preaching the gospel. Not just from the pulpit, but in every ministry of the church. <clears throat> this morning while I'm preaching, I know in our junior church, I have the confidence today that there are people there that are giving the gospel to boys and girls so they can know the, the story of salvation, the preaching of the gospel. I see a second ingredient here, and that is in verse 42, back in our text, I see a progression of faith. A progression of faith. Notice this word continue. Do you see it in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42? <clears throat> and they continued. Do you see that word continued? We see that word often in the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 14, the Bible says we should continue following the Lord your God. In John 8 32, Jesus said, If ye continue in my word... Then are ye my disciples. Acts 1.14, the Bible says they continued with one accord in prayer. Acts 13.43 says we should continue in the grace of God. Acts 14.22 says exhorting them to continue in the faith. 2 Timothy 3.14 says continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and that thou hast been assured of. I'm saying this word, continue, speaks of a progression of faith. God doesn't want us just to start out, but He wants us to finish what we start. He wants us to continue. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. What I'm saying is the early church, as a pattern, was a progressive church. It was a church that was on the move, a church on the march, a church that was continuing in the faith. And uh, I just attended a preacher's fellowship meeting this past Monday. I drove, I wasn't feeling well. Last Sunday I was under the weather and I still got a touch of it. <clears throat> Pray for me, but last Monday I wasn't feeling well and I drove an hour and 45 minutes uh, down past south of Boston and uh, <clears throat> to Webster, Mass, and attended a preacher's fellowship meeting. And one of the preachers was given an assignment to preach on, a text, a subject, a topic. And his topic was uh, how to keep Christians from burnout and how to keep ministers from burning out, you know. And it was a great message. I sat there and listened and had some very good things to say about it. I have no criticism of the message at all. But I got to thinking while I was sitting there, <clears throat> I have 
rarely met someone who burned out for Jesus. <laughs> I have rarely met someone who really, truly burned out for Jesus. My experience has been, I've seen people back out, I've seen them duck out, <laughs> walk out, cop out, slide out, foul out. I've seen them run out. I've seen them flip out. <laughs> uh, I've seen a lot of that, but I've seen very few Christians burn out for Jesus. But the Bible does tell us not to be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And so, <clears throat> thank God, there's, there should be a steadfastness about our faith. A good church not only preaches the gospel, but a good church will be continuing in the faith, progressing in the faith. And you find that in the Word of God. None of us would, would enjoy seeing a baby that's born, taken from the hospital and... <clears throat> and uh, put on the doorstep of a home and just left there to fend for itself or himself or herself. <coughs> Nobody would take a newborn baby and set that baby on the doorstep of a home and say, well, <coughs> I hope he makes it. <laughs> I hope she makes it. No, you would take that baby inside the home and love that baby and nourish that baby and feed that baby and care for that baby and help that baby take its first steps and help that baby grow. That's what should be done, right? But why do we see in the church house today so many people where salvation takes place, a new birth takes place, and we're leaving our converts on the doorstep of the churches instead of helping them take their first steps in the Christian faith. And God has burdened my heart about that. <clears throat> That's why we started this class. And Brother Dave Roy taught this morning our Foundations of Faith class. We're trying to help <clears throat> get people established in the faith. All of us need that, the establishing of our faith. Amen? All of us need that. <clears throat> and no matter <clears throat> how old we are, no matter what stage of life we're in, all of us need to be rooted and grounded in our faith. And we need to continue in that faith that's been delivered unto us. And that's the responsibility that we have, is to help people continue to progress in the faith. And we're doing that. Thank God for it. And we ought to do more of it. Amen? <clears throat> Number three, I, I see here in this first church not only the preaching of the gospel and the <coughs> progression of Christians and of faith, but also see number three, a priority upon doctrine. A priority upon doctrine. The Bible says in verse 42, and they continued, there's progression, steadfastly in the apostles, what? What's the next word? <clears throat> doctrine. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles, what's the next word? Doctrine. Do you see that? Doctrine. In other words, they were devoted to unmovable, unchangeable truth. That's what doctrine is. That's what the teachings of the apostles were. And uh, <clears throat> the Bible places a great emphasis upon Bible doctrine. Listen, what you believe is very important today. Very important. I've heard people say this, Well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as we all love one another. <laughs> Well, that, that type of weak Christianity won't take you far. The Bible says we ought to be rooted and grounded in our faith. We ought to know what we believe and why we believe it. <clears throat> and of course, we ought to love one another. I understand that. But we ought to know what we believe. The Bible says <clears throat> in Romans six seventeen, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin... But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine and continue in them. I'll give you one more scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. 
and is profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible says there come a time when men will not endure sound doctrine. And we're living in that day today. People today have sacrificed doctrine on the altar of fellowship. Let's just all get along. It doesn't matter what we believe. Well, this ecumenical spirit today has to be kept outside of the church. I'll tell you why. Because it's dangerous. It does matter what you believe. I can't join hands with someone and call them brother if they deny the virgin birth of Christ and deny the bodily resurrection of Christ, they're not Christians if they deny those things. We're not brothers. The Bible says, how can two walk together lest they be agreed? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? People, that, people who deny the virgin birth of Christ and who deny the resurrection of Christ and who deny the blood atonement of Christ are in darkness today. They're not walking in light. They've never been saved. You say, well, I just don't, don't believe that. Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe with thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The Bible says you can't even be saved unless you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Salvation comes through believing not part of the gospel, but all of the gospel. He died, he was buried, and he rose again. If you deny any part of that, then you are a, an unbeliever and an infidel and a heretic. And the Bible says <clears throat> and tells us in no uncertain terms, there must be a priority upon doctrine. And I'm glad today in our church here at Victory Baptist that we believe the word of God. We're trying to teach the Bible and preach the Bible. And this Bible I hold in my hand is our final authority for all faith and practice in our church. Bible doctrine is so important. And it's, it was important in the, in the pattern church in the book of <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. And it's also important in our church today. And then we see thir uh, fourthly, <clears throat> look at the next word. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Fellowship. There's the practice of fellowship in the church. Fellowship. Do you see that? They were devoted to fellowship. They loved one another. Acts 2.42 talks about that fellowship. Verse 44 says, And all that believed were, what's the next word? Together. There's fellowship. By the way, that's where Christians ought to be. Christians ought to be together, assembled together, part of one family, one body, one congregation, having all things in common. The Bible even says in chapter 4, in verse number 32, the scripture says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them, that ought of the things which possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Notice here the togetherness, the unity found in the local church in the book of Acts. And may I say this morning, that's a great ingredient of a good church. Not only the preaching of the gospel, the progression of our faith, the priority upon doctrine, but there must be a practice of biblical fellowship among God's people. There must be a devotion among the people of God <clears throat> towards each other, having all things in common, having one burden, one heart, one direction, one vision, one goal. And uh, their breaking of bread and in fellowship, the scripture says. That word fellowship literally means to share something in common. It's a partnership, the scripture says. And uh, we share a, a common commitment to Christ. He's our Savior. 
We share a common lifestyle. We walk in the light and have fellowship one with another. We share a common goal to magnify and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We share a common purpose, that is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And thank God for that today. There must be a practice of fellowship. And then I'll give you one last thing today. Look in verse 42. The Bible says, and in breaking of bread, and what's the last thing? And in prayers. In prayers. <clears throat> you see here the power of prayer. If the church is going to advance, the church must advance on her knees. The early church believed in prayer. The early church was a praying church. The Holy Spirit fell on the, on the day of Pentecost. All believers were saved that had assembled, and they prayed, the Bible says. And there was a great move of God on the day of Pentecost because they were all in one accord, and the Bible says they prayed together. And if you'll study all the great revivals of the past and the great awakenings, you'll find one thing, one common thread, one common thread, you'll find all of it was bathed in prayer. Take a look today at the churches that are winning souls to Christ, baptizing new believers, and you'll find those kind of churches are praying churches. And may God help us today to see there's no substitute for prayer. If we're going to be a strong church, <clears throat> we must give priority to prayer and taking time to ask God for His power, for His anointing, and for His enablement. We've, got, we've set a goal of 200 people for Family and Friend Day. We're trying to encourage our church family to bring back prospects. And we want to pray for this special day. None of this can be done without the power of prayer. And may God help us to see that these are the ingredients of a great church. I could say more about their stewardship and their evangelism and things of that nature. But may God help us this morning to see the importance of prayer. May we pray together this morning.